one of the things I'll be talking about today is love and feeling loved. And I want to look at the camera and say to those that are tuning in, we love you. And I know it's very difficult to communicate that through cyberspace, but I believe the Spirit of God that is here is right where you're at, wherever you're at. And so I pray that the Spirit of God will stir your heart as you're sitting in your living room or sitting in your kitchen or laying in bed or, or listening to it later, right? Somebody's on a treadmill, somebody's in a vehicle right now, and I just pray that you would feel loved. It's not enough to say it, is it? Words are empty, right? But when those words are filled with authentic love, it, it means something. It doesn't hit us here, it hits us here, right? Sometimes people say, I love you, and it offends me because I don't feel it, right? People that have hurt me that want to gaslight me by saying, I love you, or I love you, brother. Don't even say it. Don't even say it, right? But when it's said from a sincere heart, it means a lot. And I want you to feel loved. That's a big part of church, it really is, is to feel loved where it's authentic, where it's sincere, where it's not obligatory, where it's not a slogan, where you want to come back not because of the worship or the kids' ministry or the preaching, where you want to come back because you feel loved in this place. All of us walk into multiple rooms throughout the week, and most of those rooms we don't feel loved. Let's be honest. And the tragedy is that some of you, your home is one of those rooms where you walk into a home that is filled with conflict and you don't feel loved even at home. And I pray to God that if there's one room you walk in throughout the week where you feel loved, it's this one. Not because of me, but because of God, because of Jesus. And so a special shout out to our Be the Church online faith family. Hmm? Oh. Let me start off with a statement. And I want you to tune in. I want you right now to be curious about what I'm about to say. A statement about you. Some of you are like, you don't even know me. How can you say anything about me? Because the Bible makes these blanket statements about humanity, of which we're all a part. So I'm about to make a statement about us. I include my, myself in that because this is how the Bible describes us over and over again. People are sheep. We are sheeple. Have you ever really thought about that before? The fact that of all the animals in creation that God could have used as an illustration of humanity, why would he choose sheep? I would prefer something more majestic, like an eagle. Something more awe-inspiring, like a liger. <laughs> or here we are in Canada, I'm, you know. Excuse me. Something more majestic, like beaver. <laughs> Sheep are mentioned in the Bible more than 500 times, more than any other animal. Sheep are a part of the story from Genesis to Revelation, and Throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, sh sheep are used to symbolize us, humanity. Now, what do you know about sheep? One of the problems with reading and understanding and applying the Bible is that the culture is so radically different. And so in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's a very agricultural context. So Jesus often uses illustrations that are incredibly relevant to the original audience, but are foreign to us. He's talking about farming. And so it's 
we, we kind of are able to piece it together. You know, when Jesus, he talks about animals talks about shepherds. The Bible talks about shepherds. How many of you know a shepherd? Like a legit shepherd. Awesome. We have one. And the, the guy you told me about, right, in the UK? No. Oh. I think every Christian should have at least one sheep. It's a living sermon. I mean, we have dogs, right? How, how, how many pet people do we have? No, we have cats, any goldfish people, any weirdos with ferrets. <laughs> Why not a sheep? Is that even legal? Can I have a sheep in my house? Can I have a flock in Charleswood? <laughs> it would fit right in. No, they would fit in Charleswood because there's, there's a herd of deer. You know, and I, I saw a turkey the other day. It's no joke. It's like a petting zoo. So every Christian should have at least one sheep and you should study it because this animal, God says, represents us. And I think as a part of seminary or Bible college, there should be one semester of shepherding because the Bible says spiritual leaders are shepherds of God's people. And so more than learning theology and church history and Hebrew and Greek, we should take care of sheep, like actual legit sheep. And that'd be more, I think, relevant than a lot of the classes that I took in seminary when it comes to actually leading people, caring for people. Sheep are not majestic animals. They are not strong and independent creatures. They're not proud hunters or fierce predators. To be honest, they're actually kind of pathetic. <laughs> Listen to this true story. Hundreds of sheep followed their leader off a cliff in eastern Turkey, plunging to their deaths while the shepherds looked on in dismay. 400 sheep fell 15 meters to their deaths in a ravine in Van province near Iran, and the first 400 broke the fall of the following 1,100 sheep. All of them would have died if not for the first 400 that created a pillowy cushion for the other 1,000 to fall on. Shepherds from a nearby village neglected the flock while eating their breakfast, leaving the sheep to roam free. One sheep wandered off the cliff and 1,499 others followed that sheep without question. It's completely absurd and tells us one important fact about sheep is that sheep absolutely need a shepherd. If left to themselves, they are in trouble on multiple levels. Sheep are, are not just dumb, but they're also defenseless. Just about any other domesticated animal can be returned to the wild and will stand a fighting chance of survival, but not sheep. Put a sheep in the wild and you've just given nature a snack. <laughs> they don't have claws. They don't have fangs. They don't have venom. They don't have spines or quills or talons. They don't even have camouflage to hide. They aren't fast and agile. <laughs> they don't bark or roar. What do sheep do? Somebody make a good sheep sound. <laughs> Listen, we're all sheeple, so I want all of us to symbolic, symbolically sound like a sheep on three. One, two, three. <laughs> that, was a, that was a sick flock of sheep, man. <laughs> now, does that, uh, d does that make you fearful when you hear that sound? Like on Halloween and you're trying to put some stuff up in your yard to scare the kids or the teenagers or the adults, let's be honest, that are coming up. Do you put a, a sheep sound? What was that? Or in the night, you're camping at night and you hear a wolf howl in the distance. You're like, whoa, you put another few sticks on the fire, you know, maybe grab your knife and hold it a little closer. But what if you were to hear a, a sheep baa in the night? Anybody afraid? Or, or do you want to go rescue it, actually? Like, do you feel sorry for the sheep? Oh, I bet it's cuddly. I'm kind of cold. I want to go get that sheep and put it in my tent with me. Are you offended that the Bible uses this specific animal to describe us? Whether we like it or not, 
We are sheeple, and history proves that over and over again. We are so easily led astray, and so all of us are in desperate need of a shepherd. With that in mind, let's read John chapter 10. We come across yet another I am statement in the Gospel of John. Would you please stand as we read God's word together? John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The word of the Lord. You can be seated. Remember now, it's one story. The chapters and verses were added hundreds of years after the Bible was written. And they were added as study helps, study tools. So today I could tell you, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. We'll be reading verse through verse. But this is one story. It's connected, really, from Genesis to Revelation. It's one meta narrative. It's one story. It's a story of redemption. The Old Testament, where God is building the stage for thousands of years onto which the Messiah would walk out in the New Testament. The New Testament is the story of the culmination of God's plan of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. Chapter 10 flows out of chapter 9, where Jesus had yet another conflict with the religious leaders of his day. Jesus is accusing them, these religious leaders, of being illegitimate shepherds. He's accusing them of being imposter, imposter shepherds. These are people that attained their positions of power through manipulation and intimidation, through deceit and deception. They didn't care for the sheep. They only cared for themselves. The sheep were a means to an end. And let me back up and offer a brief caveat here where this is specifically applied to spiritual leadership, but it can be more broadly applied to any leadership in every arena. Politicians, politicians that achieve their power through deceit and deception, through intimidation and manipulation, politicians that look at the people as a means to an end, they aren't really there to help us, they're there to use us to help themselves. 
even on the level of an organization, whatever, wherever you work, there's microcultures in every organization. And if you have a leader, if you have a CEO, if you have a supervisor that is there and sees you as a stepping stone to their own advancement, that's not a good leader. I don't care if you're Christian, not Christian, if you're atheist, I don't care what your religion is. There is a general principle here when it comes to good leadership. And so I could give a talk at, in a boardroom of a business, I just take out the spiritual components and this would be just as effective to a, to a business to say, do you really care for the customers? Or are they just a means to an end? Are you seeing them as human beings? Or are you seeing their wallets and purses? Politicians, like, did this person actually give a rip about my family, about my life? Or are they just ambitious? Are we here in Manitoba just a stepping stone to something greater, more spectacular? But back to the specific application of spiritual leadership. Listen here in Ezekiel chapter 34. This is from the very beginning. This is God's heart, right? And spiritual leaders are to reflect the heart of God for his people. A lot of, a lot of Christians have a bad theology because of how God has been represented through spiritual leaders, religious leaders in their life. So they think that God is angry and wants to send everyone to hell, not because they've studied the Bible, but because they've been discipled by someone that communicates that way. God is, you know, a judge in the sky holding his gavel, ready to slam it down on anyone and everyone. Right? Do you know religious leaders that have created that mentality? Ezekiel chapter 34, this is the word of the Lord that came through Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds. Again, he's not talking about actual shepherds. The, the Bible uses this really, really powerful image of people being sheep and pastors and priests being under shepherds. You have the ultimate shepherd is Jesus, but then you have the under shepherds that are supposed to embody his heart for his people. It's not just about theology, man. It's about affection. People that have pristine theology, but they don't love people. You're DQ'd, brother. You are disqualified from spiritual leadership. I don't care what you know. Do you love me? I don't think you love me. The word of the Lord came, rebuked the shepherds, saying, Woe to you shepherds who only take care of yourselves. Should not the shepherd take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wander all over the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched for them. Whew. That is a scathing rebuke from God to the preachers of their day. Do you know any preachers that perhaps fleece the flock today? Preachers that take and take and take. You notice something about our church, and this is on purpose. We rarely talk about money. And when we do, it's about money to help other people. Right? It's about, hey, God has given you resources, not so the preacher can drive a nicer car, but so that other people can buy groceries and pay rent. Right? A lot of the times it's subtle, you know, where we, we take up offerings and it's to perpetuate the organization, right? We need a certain amount to keep this building going, to keep this staff going. And so it's, not, it's actually taking from you, right, to say, 
listen, we, we need your money if we're gonna keep this, you know, if we're gonna keep this thing going. They didn't care for the sheep. False shepherds, they infiltrate the pen. They don't enter through the gate. They sneak in through some other way and lead the sheep astray. Remember now, sheep aren't known for their cunning or their discernment, so they will follow false shepherds, charlatan shepherds, all day long. By the way, this is true religiously. This is true politically. Right? Just go to 1930s Germany. Right? Millions of people that followed a charlatan leader catastrophic results. But it's true religiously as well. Perhaps the most tragic example that comes to mind, at least in modern history, is Jim Jones. You ever heard this story before? He claimed to be a Christian leader, by the way. Very charismatic, so much so that he was able to motivate people to sell everything their houses, to leave everything, their family, their friends, and to move to South America. And when he saw that the ship was going down, he wanted to take as many people out as possible with himself. So you ever heard the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid? This is where it comes from. Jim Jones ordered his leaders, his staff, to mix poison in with the Kool-Aid, and they drank it. They, they, it wasn't a secret. They knew they were killing themselves. And here's the most tragic part of that. Over 900 people died, and over 300 of those were children. It's like, why? I mean, from a distance, we're looking at them saying, but in that moment, They really believed that this man was sent from God and to disobey him meant disobeying God and he was going to take them to glory. We're sheeple. And before you judge them too harshly, we're made of the same stuff. All of us. We're just as susceptible. You think you're smarter than them? You think you're better than them? You're not. I'm not. Jesus says that he is the gate and all who climb into the pen by any other way are illegitimate shepherds and they aren't there for the good of the sheep. They are there for their own good. And don't lose sight of the fact that Jesus is referring to the religious leaders of his day. And for them, they were so deceived that they thought by torturing the son of God, they were actually doing the work of God. And the people, the tens of thousands of people in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, they said nothing. Why? Why? Because they were idiots? You think they were stupid people? Oh, here we are, and here's this um, North American 21st century arrogance, right? Oh, oh, yeah, we're more evolved now. Those people, those backwater people, those, you know, illiterate people, uh, you know, we, that couldn't happen today, right? I mean, there's no way that you could, you could get me to be a part of that. You, you're deceived. You are, if you think that, you are a part of the problem. You are deceived. If you think you are immune to deception, You're already there. And these people were, and again, it was a small handful. Even among the leaders, they're leaders among leaders, right? I'm not talking about all the Sadducees and Pharisees and priests. There were hundreds and hundreds of these people, thousands of them. There were thousands of Pharisees, very influential people. And in that group, there is a group. You've been a part of these before. You ever been part of a team or a board or, right, where there's a leader among the leaders? And what that leader says, the rest of the leaders fall in line. And so there is a small group of people that are ultimately responsible for the torture and murder of Jesus Christ. And everyone follows. Do you remember this scene, this tragic scene? Jesus Christ who came to help, he came to heal, he came to liberate people. And the very people that he came to help 
They're standing there and he's been beaten. Right? It's a, it's a, it, if he were standing here today in that, in that condition, it would make some of you vomit. Like it is, it, it's horrible what they've done to him already. And he's standing there in front of the people and the religious leaders have worked the crowd and Pilate says, who shall I release to you? Shall it be Barabbas who is a thug or Jesus the Christ? And what does the crowd say? Barabbas! And Pilate, Pilate the pagan, he is dumbfounded. He's saying, wait, wait, I want to be sure I'm hearing you right. You want this guy, the guy that's selling drugs to teenagers on the street. You want this guy, the guy that has been convicted multiple times of crimes. I want to be sure I'm hearing you right. And, you, and what, what do you want me to do with Jesus the Christ? What do you want me to do with this guy? And what do they say? What? crucify, crucify, and they're, they're yelling it, they're screaming it, and here's Jesus, and he's standing here. All he came to do was help. All he came to do was heal. How many hundreds, if not thousands of people did he feed supernaturally? How many thousands of people did he heal? He raised people from the dead, which by the way, we'll get to next week in chapter 11. And here's Jesus. He has never hurt anybody, but he did do one thing. He offended the people in power. He, he was a boat rocker. He stirred the pot, man. And for that, he's standing there. And they're yelling, crucify, crucify. And of course us, again, we wouldn't. We wouldn't do that, would we? If, you know, if, if Jesus were here today, I'd be by his side. You're going to have to come through me to get to him. Oh, if he were here today, you know, over my dead body, are you going to touch this guy because he's legit? He is the son of God. This guy's done nothing wrong. How many, you really think? The people in the crowd back then, you really think they were a bunch of cowards and idiots? They were being led by charlatan shepherds. And when that happens, we can be complicit in horrible things, evil things. All of us are susceptible to that. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, by the way they act. One paraphrase puts it this way, be wary of false preachers who smile a lot. <laughs> I like how he put that. Dripping with practice sincerity. Chances are they are out to rip you off in some way. Don't be impressed with charisma, look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions to get to your money. Let me just pause here because this is traumatic for some of us. For many people, it's tragically relevant. Tragically relevant. Why do I say that? Because some here have been the victims of Charlotte's and Shepherds. And we have the scars to prove it, don't we? Sheep that have attacked, uh, have attacked us, other sheep, at least we thought they were sheep. You know, sheep don't have fangs. What are those teeth called that wolves have? Like the sharp ones. Yeah, canine. They, like they don't, it, it's used for tearing. It's, it's tearing of meat. Right? They're designed to kill. Sheep eat grass. There's no fangs. There's no canines. And so when all of a sudden in your, a, a tragic part of some of our stories is that we get attacked by a sheep and we realize in that moment that this isn't a sheep because of how it feels. If a sheep bites you, you're like, get off me. What do you think you are? That's cute. <laughs> I've never been bitten by a sheep. Maybe it hurts. I have been bitten by a horse and it did hurt, by the way. So maybe it does hurt a little bit, but it probably is not going to break the skin. It's probably not going to rip the flesh. They're probably not going to ingest what they just bit off. 
And so I'm so sorry. I am truly sorry for that part of some of your stories where you've been spiritually abused. You've been attacked by the very people that you thought were there to care for you. And someday maybe we can share our scars. I'll show you mine. You can show me yours and we can, there's, there's healing in the telling sometimes. Right? Maybe you can show me your scar and tell me the story. Here's the thing. Sheep aren't carnivores and so if it eats meat, it ain't a sheep. <laughs> and this is important here because some of you are here for a season. Some of you are here just for today. But in a church, listen now, if lamb chops are regularly on the menu, find the nearest exit immediately. Immediately. If they are attacking people within the church, if they are crucifying people within the church, get out. I don't know how much stronger I can say it because you could be next. If you cross the person in power, they will slaughter you. Get out. With that in mind, let's take a look at the most popular verse in this chapter. What do you think the most popular verse in John chapter 10 is? John chapter 10 is a memory verse for me back in the day. John chapter, do you know any verses by heart from John chapter 10? Anybody? John 10.10 10 says, somebody help me out. Help a brother out. The preachers, you're leaving me hanging out to dry here. The thief. That's right. But I. Thank you. This is Jesus. Jesus is saying, and remember, I, I, I gained a, a richer understanding of this verse through my study this past week because I always thought that he was talking about Satan. Like that was a, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And ultimately that's true. But the immediate application, the context of the verse, he's talking about religious leaders, about charlatans. That's what he's talking about here. They have come, they have infiltrated the flock, and they're here to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, that ain't me. And I'm so sorry that your theology has been shaped by charlatans, and you think God is vicious, you think God is angry, you think God is just, just up there with lightning bolts looking to smite people. Fear is a powerful motivator. And so Jesus is saying, but I have come to offer something radically different. Radically different. And the under shepherds of the ultimate shepherd, the pastors and the priest, should offer this. And what is that? Life. And not just life, what? Abundant life. Overflowing life. Life on a level that you never thought was possible. So that's what we should be offering here. That's what I should be offering as an under shepherd of the ultimate shepherd is not fear and intimidation and manipulation. It is life. Come here, y'all, and find life. There is clean water here in the desert. There is good food here, and you're famished. And then you, you get to go out and you say, listen, I, I don't know what you believe about God, but there's this place that, man, I, you have to come, you just have to experience it for yourself, right? I, <laughs> and they show up and they don't find judgment, right? I've been in those churches and I've been that preacher and I, I have to confess it. You know, where you suck and you suck and this person's going to hell and this, per and this group of people, they suck. And I mean, just ranting and raving and pounding the pulpit. Everybody but me sucks. It's like, whoa, whoa, buddy. Tap the brakes. Like, is that the message you want people to hear? If they only come to church one time and they walk in on that day and you're slinging the brimstone, is that they're, they're going to walk out with theology whether you realize it or not. 
that's the impression you want them to have of Jesus Christ? He said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, overflowing, abundant life. To care for the sheep because they love them. This is the heart of Jesus that every under shepherd should have, regardless of denomination, regardless of whatever affiliation you have. Every single under shepherd, whether it's a pastor, a priest, whoever, to care for the sheep. Not because they have to, but because they want to, because Jesus has put that heart in them, his heart for the sheep to lead them to good pasture and good water where they can be nourished and refreshed, to protect them from the predators that are always prowling. You know, shepherds, and they might still to this day in the Middle East, but at the time they would carry a weapon called a rod. And so when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the under shepherds that are reflecting the heart of the ultimate shepherd carry a weapon. I know, I know, you know that Canadian pacifism you're the guy right now. You're like, I don't know about weapons, man. You know, uh, you know, I got that Mennonite pacifism kind of stirring up in my heart right now. Come on now. But this is legit. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and shepherds carried a weapon called a rod, which was a piece of oak that had a knob on the end of it. And into this knob, they would put nails to make it a more effective club against the predators. No good shepherd would be without this weapon but they never use the weapon on the sheep. Here's the thing. Good shepherds do not attempt to domesticate wolves. They kill them. That's hard. But seriously, right? All all throughout the Bible, David, the man after God's own heart, he killed predators with this weapon. And Jesus is the son of who? David. And so Jesus sees the, the wolves that are infiltrating the flock and he sees the havoc they're causing and the pain they're causing and the damage they're inflicting. And he's not just saying, well, you know, let's pray for the wolves. He says, no, you have to protect the sheep. And he actually says here, if you don't protect the sheep, you are a sucky shepherd. If I'm sitting here and I love you and I care for you and it's a supernatural love and I see someone that's attacking you, I'm not just going to sit there and watch it happen. I'm going to intervene, man. I'm going to not, I'm going to protect you in the, in the best way that I can. And sometimes that means going wolf hunting. <laughs> well, you don't have to hunt for them. They're already here, Right. Here's the question you should always ask when it comes to leadership in general, but especially spiritual leadership. Does this person care for me? This is not something that can come across on a resume. It has to be discerned in person. A good shepherd knows the sheep. Let me conclude with Luke chapter 15. Jesus again is talking about sheep and shepherds. In Luke chapter 15, I really want you to... uh, Read this verse this week. Meditate on this verse this week. Let me read this here. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Oh my gosh, I got to hesitate from talking about this passage, right? Because we are now the body of Christ. We are now to manifest the same Jesus that walked the planet 2,000 years ago is here now, and we are his body in the world today. And the same kind of people that were attracted to him then should be attracted to us now. Sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. Now, here's, here's the question. Do those kind of people feel welcome here or repelled by here? Right? Let me look around the room and how many horrible sinners have shown up today because they've heard that Jesus is here and he is not like those other religious leaders, those self-righteous leaders 
How many of us would be incredibly uncomfortable if the people that were around Jesus, all of us showed up here? And that discomfort is an indictment against us because we've made it into something that it wasn't supposed to be. This is not a holy huddle. It's a hospital for the sick. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And this is where I want to conclude. This is what I want to drive home. This is what I want you thinking about as you walk away. The ultimate shepherd wants to find you. And we think we're running from the shepherd, right? We're, we hear the shepherd approaching and we run away because we think the shepherd's going to judge us for being lost. We think the shepherd has this rod with a gnarly knob of nails and we think he's going to come up and good job, just finish us off because we deserve it. We deserve it. And that voice that we're hearing, that voice of accusation and condemnation, you suck. Look at all that you've done. The shepherd's going to find you and he's going to reprimand you. He might even kill you. And so you run from the shepherd most of your life. And you're believing the lie about who the shepherd is. And again, some of these lies came from pulpits. God is angry with you. God hates you. You better hope he's in a good mood if he ever finds you. As sheep, we all stray, all of us, some more than others. But regardless of how far you've strayed, the ultimate shepherd is looking for you. He wants to find you, not to judge you, but to rescue you, to care for you, and to carry you back home. And when you get home, they throw a party. Now listen to this now, church. This is the kind of church I desperately want to be a part of, right? When someone walks in and it's well known that they've been in a prodigal chapter for years. When someone walks in and they don't look like we think they should look or they don't smell like we think they should smell. When someone walks in even that maybe even inebriated or high. They're walking in here and rather than say, how dare you taint our fellowship with your nastiness? Rather than, we're like, God, we've been waiting on you. Come on, I'm stopping the sermon, man. And we're gonna sing and we're gonna celebrate. Call your friends, call your family. Somebody order a, a, a feast. Isn't that the kind of church you want to be a part of? Isn't that the kind of church you want your kids to be a part of, man? Not one where that initial reaction is judgment and condemnation and self-righteousness. That one, that initial reaction is one of celebration. I am so glad you're here. We saved a seat for you right here. We've been waiting on you, been praying for you. One commentator said, the apparent recklessness of the shepherd is meant to emphasize his love for the lost sheep, a love that risks losing the 99 to gain the one. It's a reckless love, a reckless love. So today, stop believing the lie and stop running from the shepherd. Stop running from the rescue. Let yourself be found. Let yourself receive the embrace of the shepherd. Let him pick you up and carry you back home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message that is so powerful and emotional. And as best as I could, I tried to describe your heart for us. And the human language and the human vocabulary is woefully insufficient to describe a reckless love that you have for us, that you would leave the 99 in the open country. You would leave them vulnerable and you would come after me. I'm so unworthy of such a love and yet I desperately need it. We all do. And so wherever we're at today, 
Lord, we allow ourselves to be found and carried home. In Jesus' name. Amen.